Howdy, everyone. Howdy. Thank you for joining us. We've had a busy week here at the Aggie Agora, um, and this is absolutely going to be a treat for all of us. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce you to Judge John Dietz today. Um, as you know, our fall lectures and workshops and coffee hours and our special events are devoted to exploring issues related to the possibility of achieving the American dream today in the United States. We're supporting the university's Common Ground Reading Program, which as you know, um, hopefully you got a chance to meet Robert Putnam last week, I think it was just last week. Um, he wrote a fantastic book that explores issues of the American dream and particularly issues related to Judge Dietz's conversation today um, in Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. Um, so we're giving all of our speakers a copy of the book so that I think actually that you can like this book. Um, so, that, so that we can help to spread the good word about inequality in the United States and um, the possibility of achieving the American dream today, which absolutely education is a part of it. Um, let me just say a few words about Judge Dietz. He earned his BA and his MA in Educational Psychology from the University of Texas, as well as his JD from UT in 1977. He worked as Administrative Assistant to Senator Lloyd Doggett. Did I say that properly? Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Administrative Assistant to the Attorney General of Texas, John Hill, Special Crimes Prosecutor, Instructor in Trial Advocacy at the UT School of Law, State District Judge, and Presiding Judge of Travis County very, very distinguished resume. Judge Dietz tried the last two Texas school finance cases in 2004 and 2012, 2013. Judge Dietz's lecture will give a historical look at the origins of public education and the constitutional duties in Texas. He will discuss present levels of school financing, current gaps in student achievement in Texas, and the implications for Texas in 2050. His lecture includes discussion of the last two recent um, school finance cases. And uh, please join me in welcoming Judge Dietz. Thank you. Uh, this cannot be bought in stores, as you guys know. It's only earned. So I hope you'll wear it with pride. I will, I will. <laughs> Especially, I'm in search of a good football team. And I, <laughs> I hear that I might find it here. Um, so, thank y'all for having me, but um, I want to let you know up front, I'm not really an expert in education, um, although I have heard a great deal. Um, this last case uh, was the largest school finance case in Texas history. We had uh, 200,000 exhibits and it was over a million pages of paper. We were in trial 75 days, and uh, I believe over 100 witnesses. And it had, it had taken me, because I had done a previous case, um, I had spent six months doing preparation. Well, how do you prepare for something like that? You, you reacquaint yourself with uh, the legislature's Byzantine formulas for financing schools, and then you start taking a look at um, statistics. But today, here's kind of the outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons uh, of, of public education. How did, how did public education get to be a governmental function? Um, you may not be aware of this, but if you take education K through 12, and you add in the public universities like A&M, uh, it comprises about a third of the state budget. So it is the largest single enterprise of Texas government is public education. Um, but how did it get to be a governmental function? And it wasn't always that way. But the first thing I want to show you is this is the constitutional guarantee for public education in the state of Texas. It is written in our 1876 Constitution, and it has three standards for public education contained within it. Now, as you read it, I don't know if your response is the same as mine was, 
but I'm going, who writes this stuff? Uh, because it's not a, it doesn't appear to be a model of clarity because it starts talking about a general diffusion of knowledge being essential to the rights and liberties of its citizens. What is that? Where did that come from? We're going to find out. And then it tells the legislative duties. What is it that the legislature has to do? They have to do two things, or actually three things. They have to design a suitable system. They have to design it, they have to operate it, and they have to maintain it. So every two years, the legislature has the duty to um, fund fully an education system that will generally diffuse knowledge into the population. And then there is a, um, a trick because it says you have to have an efficient system of public schools and people think, oh, efficiency, just like we see in the dictionary. And of course, that's not, ex that's not what it means. Efficiency, when we talk about it in constitutional sense, says that we have approximately 1,021 school districts in Texas. And efficiency means that everybody within those school districts has a reasonably equal opportunity in terms of resources that the state provides. So the way lawyers talk about our constitutional guarantee is that we have, it has to be adequate, it has to be suitable, and it has to be efficient. And we're going to take a look at what I found in the last case. But I want to talk a little bit about why you should care about this. And I'm going to be using the work of Stephen Murdoch, who taught here at Texas A&M. Uh, Dr. Murdoch testified in the West Orange Cove 2 case that I heard in 2004, and he testified in the most recent case. Um, he has a book. It's called The Texas Challenge, and it is published by Texas A&M University Press. Uh, Dr. Murdoch is now teaching at Rice. Um, when I saw him in 2004, shortly thereafter, George Bush had left the governor's office and became president and he named Dr. Murdoch as head of the United States Census Bureau. And then Dr. Murdoch has, re, uh, has left that position and is teaching now at Rice. And he had a group, and he still has a group, that he works with Texas A&M. <clears throat> and the challenge is pretty much what I'm about to go through. The challenge is this, that the United States workforce is becoming more diverse. Um, and so typically, we think that this is a good thing. Uh, secondly, the fastest growing groups within the workforce are less well educated. And I want to say up front, this has nothing to do with race. It has a lot to do with how the government is performing and educating its citizens. Um, and then people like myself, baby boomers, are retiring. And every time we retire, the average level of education drops just a little bit because the people that are replacing us are less well educated. And so <clears throat> among demographers, there's really not much dispute about this scenario. And so you say, well, OK, but so what, Dietz? Well, the so what is, is that as your education level goes down in your workforce, you become less competitive. How so? Uh, well, here's the thing. If I'm an employer, and I can find 
a bigger, better, faster, stronger, more educated workforce, I'm going to ship my job to them. Or if I can find the same education level offshore and it's cheaper, I'm going to ship my job to them. Okay, so what? Well, as you ship, ship jobs offshore, the income level begins to decline for everybody. And as the income level declines, you're less able to pay taxes. And as you're less able to pay taxes, you're less able to support education and your ability to work your way out of this. Okay, that's kind of dark. Uh, so why do I care? Righto. <laughs> well, yeah. I won't say who. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but I have a feeling I do. So, uh, why do y'all? Why should y'all care? Well, because last year, millennials—that would be y'all—supplanted baby boomers as the largest population group. So this problem is now yours to fix. We did our worst, and now y'all have got to make it better. Well, that, that's one way. So um, there is a solution, but we have got to summon our political will to do it. So back to this. <clears throat> Where did this come from? And I've got an answer for you. It's 1778, and sitting in his study at his wonderful mansion that he designed was Thomas Jefferson. And he was out looking at his fields and the tobacco he was growing, but Thomas was disquiet. He was worried. Well, why was he worried? Well, they were now in the third year of the Revolutionary War. Three years ago, or two and a half years ago, at Thomas's time, um, some people up in Massachusetts had started shooting at the British, and the British started shooting back, and then it got real serious. By 1776, um, a second Continental Congress had met in Philadelphia and they had asked Thomas, Thomas, would you draft us the first draft of a Declaration of Independence? And Thomas said, well, yes, I will do that. And so Thomas writes uh, the things that we remember, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that man is in, endowed with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that we get government is supposed to promote that, and it's only because we consent to what the government is doing, and if we don't like what the government is doing, we can alter it or replace it. So now, it's 1778, and Thomas is looking at the Revolutionary War, and he's, he's not sure we're going to make it. Why? Well, for one thing, there are no other governments in the entire world where they govern themselves. Everybody else has got some type of leader, whether it's a king or a chief or somebody that's entitled primarily through heredity to their position, and there are no other models as to what the Americans are proposing. And so he's worried whether Americans are up to it, and so he drafts a bill that he's going to introduce in the Virginia legislature, and it's a bill called a bill for the general diffusion of knowledge. So that's where that came from. Now, Thomas being Thomas, he likes to put his reasons of why he's doing something within the bill. 
if you re recollect back to the Declaration of Independence, he's putting down all the reasons of why we're trying to get rid of King George III and the British Parliament. So it's what Thomas writes in this bill um, about public education. And he says his first reason for having this is that, you know, governments, they start off really good. Yeah, we're going to do this. We promise this. We promise that. And then over the passage of time, uh, the promises kind of get unfulfilled. And then people get more interested in retaining their power. And they get more powerful. And then they become tyrants. And Thomas says that if we educate every citizen in our new government, if we educate everybody, they will understand the history of tyrants. And they will be on guard against our proposed government uh, turning into a tyranny. And that this is the best way to preserve our liberties is to have everybody on guard against tyranny. He makes a second argument. We'll need to modify it. But he says that, you know, if we're going to govern ourselves, we sure do need the brightest, the smartest, and the best and the brightest, making our laws, executing our laws, and judging our laws. We need really smart people. And being smart is not just in the privileged class. It's spread throughout the population. So what we need to do is educate the population. Now, at that time, he's not talking about women, and he's not talking about other races. But the rationale still holds, and it's why it's in this Constitution. And then he makes a third argument. And the third argument is, you know, people are going to bitch about taxes. They're going to, oh, ah, I don't even have any kids in school. Why should I pay for, and he says, how much would you pay not to live in a tyranny? And that is equal to the amount of taxes you pay. And if you get to thinking about it, how much would you pay not to live in North Korea? I pay it quite a bit. How much would you pay not to be in Syria at the moment? Well, a lot. And so just think of taxes as a way that we're not living under tyranny. Okay. So... He did that in 1778, 1836, not too far from where we're sitting today. There's a bunch of men who are upset with the government of Mexico, and they're wanting to declare their independence from the Mexican government, and they go, you know, we need to write a declaration, just like Jefferson did. And luckily, they had somebody who had studied Jefferson a lot, and he knew to write down everything they were disaffected with the Mexican government. And somewhere in there, probably about 1617, they're writing, you know, one thing that just hacks me off is that the Mexican government will just arrest you, and they don't even tell you what for. And they throw you in jail. Yeah, put that in there. And then the next guy says, and another thing, when they throw you in jail, they don't even give you a jury trial. Yeah, put that in there. And then the very next reason that they put in as a reason to separate themselves from Mexico was, you know, you look at Mexico, and it has all of these natural resources, and they haven't even established a system of public education. Oh, that's good. Make sure that's in there. So somehow, in the 60 to 70 year uh, period from the time Jefferson uh, 
gave his arguments about education uh, in the bill for a diffusion of knowledge, which, by the way, took 25 years to pass, um, it got here to Texas. In 1845, we had the Mexican War, and Texas said, uh, being a republic is really great, but it'd be better if we were a state. And they said, well, great, you have to write a new constitution. And so Texans did. And in the 1845 Constitution is a provision that is substantially the same as this one. Okay. So we have the Constitution about 15, 16 years later. Lincoln is elected. Uh, people are upset about that. And they start beginning to withdraw from the Union and secede. And Texas has an election, and they go, yeah, we secede too. And then we fight the war and lose. And then <clears throat> the winners, the radical reconstructionist, played by Tommy Lee Jones, send in the radical reconstruction government to Texas, and they, um, and people hate it. They centralize everything. There is no democracy. You're taxed like crazy. They have a state police force. You get arrested. And finally, about 1870, they said, all right, Texas, you, uh, you're reconstructed, and we're going to let you back in the Union, but you got to get a new constitution. They get around to it in 1875. The provision that sparks the most debate in 1875 is this one. People are standing up in the Constitutional Convention of 1875 going, when did education get to be a governmental function? You should do that at home. You shouldn't do you shouldn't do require, that's not the government. The government, we make laws, we administer laws, but we don't do education. Others stood up and said, have you looked at a map of Texas? How in the hell are we going to get all those kids off those farms and ranches to go to school? Others were saying, I don't know about you, but they didn't send me here to get a bunch of taxes. By the narrowest of margins, this provision passed again. Okay. It just took them a, some more time in order to get around to financing the system of education. And when they did it, they did a horrible job. And, um, but I want to say something about public education. When did public education first start? in the United States? Well, here's the answer. It started when the pilgrims came. And the reason was most of the education had taken place within the family where, where they came from England and Europe. When they got here, um, reading the Bible was very important to them. And they needed people to be able to read the Bible. And so throughout Massachusetts and New England, you see them establishing public schools. The first public school, I think, was like 1645 in Boston, the Boston Latin School. But you start seeing schools spread throughout New England. Uh, ben Franklin said, wow, Massachusetts has got a lot of public schools. We need one in Philadelphia in about 1750. But it really wasn't a big deal until um, Horace Mann uh, started advocating it. But by 1875, when we're putting it in, the United States is one of the most literate countries in the world at that time because of our public education. So I want to go back to, uh, if I may, to my trial. 
That's kind of the historical background, the reasons of why. So the question was, is the system established by the legislature, is it providing an adequate education? That is, is, is there a general diffusion of knowledge? And there's not, it doesn't get any more scientific than that. So this was my ruling. Whatever performance measure you looked at, the new STAR test, the EO end of course exams that they were going to require students to pass, the SATs, the ACTs, there were substantial, and I'm talking, I'm going to show you a graph toward the end, there were substantial gaps between Anglos, between blacks, and browns. And they were in the nature of like 20, 20 points or more. Well, how can we be doing, how can we be generally diffusing knowledge if there are these performance gaps? Why aren't you doing something, my question was, why aren't you doing something about the performance gaps? There's another group, economically disadvantaged. Um, I, they tell me that perhaps somebody else has talked about this, but 60% of our student population, which is approximately 5.2 million school children, 60%, over 3 million, are economically disadvantaged. Okay, so what? Well, here's the so what. When I showed up at school in 1953, I had a vocabulary of about 1,500 words. I probably understood about a thousand more. Now I'm talking in generalities, but it was pretty near that. An economically disadvantaged child shows up with a vocabulary of about 500 words. What? Yeah. Well, is that the end of the story? Nothing to be done? And the answer is no. What you can do, it takes about four to six years to overcome the ravages of poverty, but what you do is you start having after-school programs that aren't punitive, uh, that aren't compensatory, but help the child develop in terms of his academics. You try to, you outreach to their parents so that the parents don't see the school as an enemy and are supportive of what the school is doing with their child, and you reach out to them. And in the summer, you do enrichment programs. And so all those trips to the museums that their parents, their single parent was not able to take because they were busy working and economically providing for the child, you show the child that there's a big world and there's a lot to be interested in. Now, when I say this, there's another group called English language learners. About 20%, one out of five, of the school children in Texas, um, English is a second language. And depending on their facility, they're either limited English proficient, English as a second language, or English language learners. Well, is that the end of the story? No. It takes, again, about four to six years to get the child facile in their native language and in English. But here's the amazing thing. Those that go the four to six years, they keep track of, and they're called former ELLs. That demographic performs better than any other demographic in, on any test that you give them. Better than rich white kids? Yes. Better than rich white kids. Because, and if you think about it, you're now, you have cognitive abilities in two different languages. You've got to be pretty smart to be able to do that. 
So if you give the time, if you have the resources, you can overcome these things that are in our uh, environment. And I think the constitutional guarantee is that you take the children as you find them. The constitutional guarantee is, no, you're too hard to educate. And it's going to cost too much. We're not going to educate you. That's not the constitutional guarantee. It has to mean something. So, um, suitability. I will show you a chart. Well, hell, let me just show it to you now. So this chart is mislabeled. The yellow is constant dollars and the green is average daily attendance. I, I did it fast backwards. I, uh, anyway, and so what this shows is that, oh, where did this come from? This came from the fiscal, fiscal size up published by the Legislative Budget Board of the Legislative Budget Board is a committee of the Senate and the House of the State of Texas. And they analyze all of the budget issues and they publish and they give it to the legislators. So we're looking at what the legislature looks at. And what this shows is in the 10 years that your average daily attendance, the green line, has gone up toward the 5 million. The yellow line shows, I've got a visual, give me a second. Does anybody have a dollar? Nope, I got it. So in 2005, the legislature appropriated money and gave it to schools. Um, there was teeny tiny inflation. So that $2,005, if you gave the same dollar, would only purchase this amount in 2006. There was a teeny tiny amount of inflation in 2006, and so that $2,005 in 2007 would, and then it keeps going and keeps going. And what it shows is that this amount of money in 2006 was down to where that amount of money was. Even though they're giving more money, it's not the same purchasing power because they didn't take, they didn't take into account inflation and student, the rise in the student population. And so, actually, less money was going into the school system in terms of what it was able to purchase than 10 years ago. And we'll see in, well, hell, I'll just show it to you now. <clears throat> so I, I, I like telling this story. When I was in uh, Lubbock, uh, they had invited me out to a combination the school district and the chamber of commerce wanted to talk about student financing and there were 500 people and they were very very sweet they were very nice and I talked about this and I got an audible gasp this is published it, this is also in the fiscal size up that the legislature gets um, and it showed that in this year, 2011, Texas was 44th in the nation in terms of what they were providing per student. Okay. And I said, there are three amazing facts. First amazing fact, I want you to think of Louisiana and the swamps. I want you to think of Arkansas and the hills. And I want you to think of New Mexico and the volcanic ash. Every one of those states provides more per student than Texas does. Secondly, and I just checked on this, we're no longer 44th, we're 45th. 
The third and most amazing fact was in 1996, we were 24th. So, as I pointed out in Lubbock, and it seemed to hunt, if we had a football coach doing this, they would have been fired long ago. But we're, why are we putting up with it with our legislature? So let me go. This is going to be a good one, but I'm not ready. Um, okay, suitability. There's a lack of capacity. We're not getting, giving enough money. Why do we have Robin Hood? Do you all know what Robin Hood is? Who knows what Robin Hood is? Could you tell me? How come? It's supposed to produce financial equality between Senator, Senator Ratliff, who wrote the bill in 1995 uh, that satisfied and was reviewed in Edgewood 4, testified uh, in 2004. And he said, I was working on this bill. I'd gotten everything done and I was 200 million short. And I just couldn't come up with 200 million. So I put this thing in where we would recapture some of the local money, kicking the can down the road, thinking the legislature would fix it, and the legislature never got around to fix it, and it's grown into a $4 billion problem. And now it's so large, they can't fix it without extraordinary measures. And people go, well, how, why does that get in there? And they go, oh, this helps, this helps the efficiency. Uh, this helps even things out. It, it's because they're not giving enough money. So um, my finding was that economically disadvantaged students and ELL students are being denied a general diffusion of knowledge because Every expert who testified in two different cases, every one of them says it takes about 50% more resources to educate an ELL student and an economically disadvantaged student. And our system is just simply not doing it. Efficiency. You know, we looked at when, when I say there are 1,021 school districts, people go, doesn't that sound like too many? Well, it used to be worse. In 1949, there were 6,000 school districts. But if you think about it, 1,021, that means there are 1,021 school superintendents, 1,021 vice superintendents. So you, you, you're not adding dollars to teachers to, to teach the kids, you're paying for duplicative administrative services. Um, and when we look at it, we see differences of about three to five thousand dollars between the very richest and the very poorest. Well, that doesn't sound so bad, except if you think that that's per student and in a classroom that a teacher has that's 22 to 25 students, that's 60 to $70,000 that the richer school has per classroom than the poorer school. Well, give me 60 to $70,000 and I think I can do a better job than if I don't have that because I can get a teacher's aid that while I'm working with one student can come over and work with a group of students. I can have better materials. I can have after school and I can do those outreach programs like I was talking about. So here are what I believe, this is my editorial, are the significant problems in school finance. There are more students that are costly to educate than ever before. And so far, we, the legislature is simply not coping with that reality. Number two, 
funding formulas. Most of the funding formulas were written in the 60s and the 70s and have not been updated since. And we, and, uh, we keep look, telling them, but they don't do anything. Texas, okay, so Texas, they go, we're going to up our standards. So when they did the STAR test, they upped the standards in, on all schools. Well, that's a good thing, except you've got to provide transition money to help implement this, and they didn't do it. Now, here is the most amazing fact at all. I can take any person in state government, from the governor to the, throughout the legislature, the Texas Education Agency, and I go, okay, we have got a mountain of regulations. And it says you have to provide an accredited education. Here's an example. To report, TEA requires each district to report its finances in a certain specific way. I, I need to rest my leg here. So um, the way they do that is they give you a 902-page manual. So if you're Houston Independent School District and you have 200,000 students, you've got this 902-page manual to report your finances. If you're Sheffield Independent School District and Sheffield, Texas with 22 students, you have a 902-page manual to report your finances. And that's only a very tiny window of the amount of bureaucracy surrounding this. Well, how much does all that cost? And there is not a person in the state of Texas that knows how much it cost. You're lying, Dietz. No, I'm not. Everybody that, every state official that has taken a stand in my court, I've asked them, do you know how much it cost? And they go, no. And I say, do you know anybody that knows how much it cost? They say, no. So when they appropriate money for education, what are they doing? It's not a, what I'm trying to get across is it's not a rational, it's not a rational decision. Well, we have this many children and they need precisely this amount of money. It's not like that, it's how much can we get away with this two year term? They're and for God's sakes, we don't want to raise taxes because if we did that, we'd all get defeated. <clears throat> I said, I was interviewed, and I was going down the scenario. I said bad words that I can't repeat here, but uh, it's, it's absolutely positively incredible, and I defy anybody to tell me how much it cost. Um, in 43 states in the Union, in 43 states in the Union, there is a triangle of taxation. You have one leg is sales taxes, one leg is property taxes, and then another leg is income taxes and or corporate, corporate taxes. In Texas, we have two. We don't have an income tax. Well, what does that mean? That means we put all of the burden on two legs to produce the revenue what three legs would give you. So, well, who else does property taxes? 254 counties, all the school districts, uh, the cities, the MUDs, the municipal utility districts, every special district, the hospital districts, everybody who's got taxation is taxing on the property. And so when you hear people say, our property taxes are outrageous, it's because we're putting everything on the property tax. Uh, so... So what? Well, I'll tell you the so what. Anybody here been to Alice, Texas? 
Highway 281 south of Corpus. Tumbleweed. So those people can tax the hell out of the dirt in Alice, Texas. They can tax more than you can imagine, and they cannot even begin to raise the revenue of what somebody in Dallas, Texas can generate in Highland Park. So does that mean our constitutional guarantee depends on where you live? And the answer is, it doesn't say it does, and I don't think it does, and, the const and so it can't be that, but they're constantly fighting this battle that the dirt in Alice is not worth the same as the dirt in Dallas. We've talked about this. Here we go. So the shaded gray are black African American, the white is Hispanic, and the black is Anglo. And these are the accreditation tests in our school system. And you cannot but help notice that there is a substantial gap between the, between the various groups and what they're achieving. And looky here, in 2011, they cut $5.2 billion, 5 .2 billion out of the appropriation, and look what happened. It, they had been narrowing the gap up until that time, and then look what happened. And this, in my opinion, is unconscionable. And I said it was unconstitutional because you cannot allow this to persist. If you are, it seems to me, then you're dooming a generation of children that you're not doing the best job that you can for your children. And the thing is, is that if I put up the SAT, the curve for the SAT, you're going to see a similar type of gap. Okay, so this is, I think I talked my 45 minutes plus, uh, but it is designed for this to be a conversation and I am open and in fact I'm encouraging you to ask me questions or make statements, it doesn't make a difference. But if you don't, say I used to teach at college, I know this, I'll start calling on you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, um, thank you, that was great. And I'm a PhD student in the College of Education, and I'm also from Connecticut. So I was wondering if you know of the ruling that happened over the summer um, in Connecticut regarding the, um, the uh, cost sharing, educational cost sharing. Yeah, it wasn't very good. But, you know, the place to look is Massachusetts. And I believe it was in 1993, Massachusetts made a uh, commitment to educating the poor. And they made a number. And if, in Massachusetts, the United States ranks approximately 18th in the world. But that's 50 states, you know, and so you look at the average. If Massachusetts was a separate country, they would have the ninth best education system in the world. And so I, I don't know that they got the answer, but they're doing some things that are right. And, and Connecticut, part of the issue is, like you were saying in Texas, each, even though we're really small, each district, each um, uh, town or, or, or area has their own Funding because they feel like it would adversely affect their students to give up some funding. Do you, in Texas, is that part of the issue? I mean, I know you 
Yeah. There's been a battle. We first started having school finance cases in the late 80s. It, it followed a case that went to the United States Supreme Court that came out of San Antonio called Rodriguez. And it went to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme, and it was a um, equal protection argument. Judges, we're not getting the same equal protection of our laws because they're doing this terrible stuff in education. And the, the Supreme Court looked at that and said, well, if we grant this, uh, we'll have a lot of these cases. No, this isn't a federal question, they said. And so that is what sort of spawned um, school finance litigation. You'll see it in New Jersey, New York, just uh, Kansas, uh, Colorado, uh, it just in a number of places. And, and so they, they said, really, the U.S. Supreme Court said this is a matter for the states. And so that's what kicked off the state litigation. So in um, the late 80s, Edgewood School District in south side of San Antonio uh, started these things talking about the efficiency. And um, the Supreme Court at that time in Edgewood 1 ruled that um, it was a constitutional deprivation. The Constitution was being violated and put an injunction on the legislature to fix it. Well, the legislature goes, here, we'll do the least amount possible. Does this pass? And that became Edgewood II, where the Supreme Court says, no, that's not it. And then they did and sent it back. And again, we're going to shut down the schools. And then the legislature did, how about this? And the Supreme Court said, no, not that one. And so that's when Edgewood IV came up about what I was talking about, um, where the $200 million in the Robin Hood came, was Senator Ratliff uh, designed the bill, and he couldn't cover 200 and so he just put a patch on it, and then that became the law. Following that, uh, in West Orange Cove 1, a rich district was going, you know, you're taking a lot of our money away and you're not leaving us with enough to educate our kids. And that became West Orange Cove 2, which I tried in 2004. The case that I tried in 2012, 2013 was all of those cases. Uh, and I think with the ruling from the Supreme Court that we got on, on my case, which was, no, nah, everything looks okay could be better but it looks okay I think they were trying to get out of the school finance litigation business it's not going to change until the legislature changes quite honestly uh, is my opinion yes ma'am And what we learned from that talk was that municipal governments don't have enough money, and so they hide the fact that they don't have enough money. Instead of raising taxes, which is unpopular, they instead will um, increase fines, they'll increase fees, fees right? right. So Right. It, um, he's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's egregious, right? And it sounds like um, from, from your talk that we have a similar problem that the, 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 the school system doesn't have taxing power. It can't hide and, you know, secretly tax us. So it seems to me, and this is what you suggest, is that we need a state income tax. We do, but there's a problem. Yeah. How do we get a state income tax? Well, so... So in 2004, what I've not shown you is, a, is another issue that there's a, a, a constitutional provision that there's no 
property, uh, no state property tax. And with the way that the state was pulling money back out of, uh, out of the, it used to be the wealthy districts, but it's gone further down, that I, I said that that was operating like a state income, uh, like a state property tax. And the Supreme Court upheld me on that. Uh, so the legislature then said, hmm, so they put caps on what, uh, on what a school district could tax. And here's, here's where that became a problem. So you could have a dollar and then you got four cents, a dollar four. Thereafter, you start having to have elections if you want to raise above that. Well, that sounds real good and, and it's good politics for the legislature to do that. So the citizens go, yeah, yeah, they can't, they can't pass a tax without our say so. But if you think if you think about it, and I ruled this way, then you leave it to the local government to say whether or not you're going to follow the Texas Constitution or not. If, if the school district really does need that extra money to meet the general diffusion of knowledge, and the voters go, nah, we're not giving it to you. Then you're depriving of the Constitution. Is there anything in the Constitution about whether there is income tax? There's a prohibition against an income tax. So the Constitution is inconsistent? Well, I mean, it, it can be amended, but, you know. They're more likely to amend it. I, I think, I think heaven will come before people will vote for an income tax. Yeah, it, it does seem, I agree with you. But my life experience is people operate on emotions and not ration. At least what I see. I have a child that graduated from a property rich school district in Austin in Austin. Uh-huh. And I can tell you what that school district was doing was that the kid, the parents were required to pay participation fees for the kids to participate in any sports or fine arts program. It's about two hundred fifty dollars a year. That's not free. And they also had a, a nonprofit foundation, Ings Educational Foundation, that the parents were pressured into donating money to. That foundation paid for uh, teacher salaries. It paid for graduate school programs for the teachers. It paid for school materials. So that's how the school was paying for all of these things, just donations from the parents. Yeah, I, I was an Eanes taxpayer too. They were also doing some other things. They were taking operations and they were using their bonding capacity for facilities and transferring some of that over there. The problem is, is that in poor areas like Alice, um, Brownsville, Brownsville, Cameron County is the second poorest county in the United States. They don't have the wherewithal to do foundations and that kind of thing. And your education ought not to depend on your zip code. It just, it, it's just an anathema. So a lot of the complaints about school finance, they say, well, the schools aren't managing the money well. It's like, that's a mess. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, if you study this, go to Google and type in our failing schools, and you will get in the nature of like 200,000 hits. It's, a, it's something that's said, but it's like a shibboleth. It's not, 
it, it's just an excuse and it's not really necessarily true. How about questions over here? I'm looking. I'm looking hard. Come on, some question. It can be a tiny one. Don't be afraid. Yes. I don't, I don't think that's true, but I don't know. But the place to look is go online to the Legislative Budget Board, and when you, when you, that site will, when you go to that site, you will see a box that says uh, Fiscal Size Up 2016, and it was published at the end of September, and you click on that, Unfortunately, it's like 400 pages, but somewhere it'll give you an index of where prison is, and they'll tell you how much they're spending on prison. Okay. How about on the back row? So far, y'all have... Well, that left just the three of y'all. Yes, sir. So is a state income required to supply or are there any you know, other possible sources of revenue that could be uh, brought about without amending the Constitution? Yeah. You could pass a stronger corporations tax. But then everybody does this. They'll go, oh, you're going to ruin jobs. And, and, uh, so what they'll do is to put more of the load on the sales tax and the property tax. Because jobs, you know, better you should deprive a child of education than ruin the job process. Yeah. So I mean, even if you argue that, you know, you're going, that further down the line, they're going to be getting better workers, that would, they would still do that. No, I don't think it, it, it really doesn't make much sense. Because, because if this scenario that I showed you all up front plays out, it's not going to be a pleasant place. In 2050, it's not going to be a pleasant place unless we change it. And I think if you look at Dr. Murdoch's book, which I strongly go to the library uh, look at it, but uh, I mean, I think he'll make the case as to the economic, let me give you just some statistics that I remember from Dr. Murphy. So if you, if you uh, get an advanced degree and you compare yourself to someone who gets, who doesn't graduate from high school, you will earn $1.9 million dollars more in your lifetime than a person who doesn't graduate from high school. That, that makes those student loans look a little more palpable. Um, another statistic, and this one came from the 20th century, when we had the Great Recession. The unemployment rate among um, high school, uh, persons without a high school diploma was 13.9%. The unemployment rate among college graduates was 4.9%. Well, that makes a pretty good case about going to college now, doesn't it? But we've got to keep the kids in school. And one of the things that happens, and I invite you to do this, do your own research. They're playing fast and loose with dropout numbers. If you look um, at TEA, at the statistics, and you look at the size of your seventh, and then the next year, the eighth grade classes, and then take a look at the number of kids who four years later graduate, you'll see that they're losing 15, 
of the kids, but but they'll go, oh no no no, we're our dropout rate is we're one of the best in the nation, and and that's because a kid who's been showing up doesn't show up. the next year. You just let them out in, in June, and it's now August, and he's not there. They're under no duty to go look for him, or to find out, or to account for him. And that's not a dropout. So if you look at, if you look at the cohort, the group size of eighth graders, and then look at how many graduate four years later, it's astounding. And it's another indication that we're doing a poor job in terms of educating our population as we find them. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. schools now are like increasing their standards. I know A&M is too for like your SAT and all that stuff. So how, 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 how do we approach that? Well, um, again, I repeat, I'm not an expert on education, but here are the things that I've heard. It's a good thing to raise standards because as I used to point out when I was a juvenile judge, you're in competition now with people from Singapore, Belarus, all over the world. And so to be more smarter is a good thing. The problem is, is it takes a while to transfer into that. For instance, they had a huge number of kids not passing the STAR test. And there was a big hullabaloo. Well, the school districts did not have money to do compensatory education that summer for all the ones who didn't pass the STAR test. Oh my gosh, they're not going to be able to graduate from high school. And it got to be a real problem, so much of a problem, that in the last legislature, they said, okay, we set up this system that you got to pass these tests, and then you got to take the end of the course, and if you don't, you don't pass. And they said, do you realize that you're going to lose 200,000 children who can't graduate because they haven't passed the test and the legislature went? Okay, we'll do, we'll do away with the end of the course. Another problem solved. <laughs> but it undercut the whole reason that you're trying to do that. So if you're going to do it, you got to put your money where your mouth is. You, you've got to really do it. I mean, but you know, it's so short-sighted because what we're doing is sacrificing our present for the future. And what are you going to tell people in 2040 when they go, well, our economy here is really stinks. Yeah, we could have done something about it back in 2010, 2020, but we didn't, and so here we go. It's just, it's like investing in your future. And they either really mean it or they don't. You know, I have to say, the biggest surprise that I've had as a uh, judge is I thought I mean, I, I take my job seriously. I mean, it, it was a privilege uh, to, to be able to consider this and to contemplate it and learn about it and think about it. I thought that people would be outraged throughout the state. I thought, yeah, okay, this will get them. They'll go, they'll go, you know, 
and they got rid of a couple of legislators. There were, I've got really a, a scrapbook of nice editorials in newspapers, but there just really hasn't been the momentum to, uh, to make change. And until there is, it's not going to get any better. I mean, they, they, the legislature has convinced me they're not going to fix this problem. Because I might get, I might get not voted. Yes, ma'am. Schools and schools play into this kind of gap that you talked about. Yeah. Um, so you know, I I hope I'm responsive to your question. It, in a couple of things, I I think we've got to do a continue to do a better job at innovating. You know, when the first schools start off, you had to study Latin, you had to study ancient history, and a little bit of expression, but that was pretty much it. I heard of a school, a leaf, on the western, western edge of Houston. It's a school district. They have to serve 84 languages. It, it has a tremendous immigrant population. And there are 84 different languages in the school. They have a magnet school for people, and it has no football team, no basketball, no nothing except academics. In their class, they take pre-calculus, they take uh, trig, algebra 2, pre-calculus, calculus, and some advanced math. And they put all of those classes together. So instead of having five teachers, they have one teacher. But then they went and hired uh, like three Rice graduate students to come help the teacher, and they do it all at the same time. And so you'll have maybe a really smart graduate student helping you out on your, if you don't understand how the math works, somebody helping you out. And that way, you, you leverage a teacher who's costing you forty to sixty thousand dollars a year, and you're paying the graduate students a lot less, uh, and you leverage the power of that teacher. That's great innovation. It should be studied. If it really works, then it ought to be replicated wherever it can. Uh, private schools. Where I get nervous is when we start talking about vouchers. And, and here's why. So if you take public money, you have to do a couple of things. You have to not discriminate on the basis of race, age, <coughs> affiliations, those kinds of things. Moreover, you have to take care of disabled students. Private schools don't do that so much. And so when I hear about vouchers, what I hear is let's take money away from public education and put it to where we just have people like us. And I, it's political, that's, that is an editorial. It's not fact, it's not law, it's not anything. But it's, it's just what I hear. Uh, now, charter schools, you know why charters work? Remember all that regulation I was talking about? They have a lot less of that regulation. Now, in exchange of which, we don't pay for their buildings like we do at school districts with bonds. But um, charters operate under a lot less. Personally, I think what they ought to do is they either ought to set fire to all of their regulations and start over and do it one by one. Do we really need this? Yes. Okay. We'll do that one. Do we need that? Not so much. Get rid of it. Uh, because we're just drowning in bureaucracy. Drowning. And nobody takes a look at it. Well, why are you doing it? Because that's the way we've always done it. Yes, ma'am. So I, I teach a few service teachers, and the other day we were going over and one of the part of the definition refers to power. And part of the issue is you don't want to, you know, people who had the power do not want to relinquish it in favor of um, equality and equity. How much do you think power pays into what's happening with the resistance or the lack of action? 
a great deal. <laughs> a great deal. I mean, but, th but that's, again, that's my editorial opinion because I sit there and go, why would you do that to children? If you get a chance, sometime look on Texas Observer because I gave a candid interview with the Texas Observer. But why, why would you do this to children? I mean, I can understand they, they don't, they've not been generous with judges' salaries. I understand that. Uh, judges are a pain. Uh, but why would you do this to me? If there's anybody that you should be doing more for, it should be the children. So, uh, somebody asked me about prisons. You did. So, we used to have a system of inmate guards. And the reason we did that was that cut down on our personnel cost. And we had favored guards, and then they would go beat up prisoners. And um, so the legislature passed a bill that said no building tenders. They were called building tenders. And so when I was working for Senator Doggett, I was on the Prison Reform Commission and we go, you would go to a prison, and you, the warden would have to let you in. You'd go, and there was this huge person wearing a uniform that said BT on it. And I would look, and I'd say, Warden, is that a building tender? And he'd go, nope, they're illegal. <laughs> OK, some other question, anything? Yes, ma'am. Well, one of the issues to me about the school system is I don't know. I don't know that much. Again, I'm not a, I'm not an expert. I just have heard a lot. But, yeah. It's like to me they're warehousing the kids, and then they're saying, "Why aren't they learning?" I know they're not putting the resources in. Uh, you know, we we've looked at the building. I looked at the building issue in 2004. Uh, the bonding capacity. When I travel the state. I always drive by and I look at the schools and I can tell the schools that have got good bonding capacity because I can look at them and see whether they're new or not. And then of course you have like Allen and McKinney that have $60 million football fields, uh, which is really, well, right. yeah, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. Well, part of it is you hit it on the head. The reason the schools are so big is, is because of the football fields. Because the bigger the high schools are, it, it just determines where they compete. Well, yeah. I, I don't know. I still don't know why we don't why we don't have 254 school districts per county. Let's try that for a while and, and, and see. You know. You agree the bonds for the football elected to any more than one term. Back here. Is there any potential in your mind 
Yeah, um, I think there, you know, there are, there are all sorts of things that can help students. We know this, right, from study of technology. People <coughs> in the proprietary end of education are there to make money. They, in, in order to be true to their shareholders, so, like, if you look at Pearson, the people that were doing that, the state of Texas paid $4 billion to come up with the STAR exam. They're doing it for money. But there are, there are a number of technologies and a number of different things that we could be doing. And, th and there are places at universities to where they study this so that people don't have to continue to reinvent the wheel. And we need things like that in Texas and elsewhere where if something's working and it looks like it's working good, learn how to do it and adopt it rather than getting a grant and spending money and going to study. Just replicate what you know that works. <laughs> and you have you have the notions of validity and reliability. Yes, ma'am. No, I think there I think there are things where where online education, computer education work. But there's also not a substitute for somebody comes and goes, you know what, you're doing a really good job. You should be proud of yourself for solving that problem. You know, the, the, the things that teachers do on a daily basis. Can, can I tell y'all, for me, the fascinating story I learned during school finance is a school teacher in Brownsville, Texas. His name was J.J. Bajardo. And um, I, I got to talk with him. Brownsville, as I mentioned a while ago, is the second, sometimes it's the poorest county in the United States, but most of the time it's just the second poorest. And uh, it's across from Matamoros, which features from time to time 13-hour gun battles in the cartel. And it's really a tough place to bring up kids. And JJ had a group of six to eighth graders, and they were boys, and they were always kind of looking to get in mischief. And he goes, how am I going to keep these kids in how am I going to keep these boys? How am I going to keep them involved? And he taught them chess. And now, I was eighth grade chess champion. So here I'm an ex. I never got any better, but I was eighth grade. I fell on wheels. So he um, kind of spread around. Two years, his school won the state chess championship, and it was the first time for seven years in a row. People in the valley began to look at that, and they were going, well, they're getting all this publicity for being state chess champion, and maybe we ought to do it. Currently, Brownsville Independent School District has 4,000 children participating in chess with tournaments on a weekly basis. And the way I found out about it was a teacher was testifying from uh, Harlingen. And as she testified, I looked up Sam Houston Elementary School and I see that they're announcing their chess championship, that they have won their first state championship, and it features this little kid uh, 
and they scrimmage against high schools and others, and they have just won the state championship. And then it spread to the University of Texas at Brownsville. They couldn't, they wouldn't let them play football, but Brownsville became um, a, they started providing scholarships for chess teams. If you go to the United States Chess Championship Chess Federation's website, and they'll show you pockets of interest in chess. The biggest one is New York, Boston, and Brownsville, Texas. <laughs> and it was all, all because of this one teacher trying to figure out how to keep his kids in school and how to keep them involved. And I mean, you go down in the valley now, and there, there are chess tournaments every week. Um, and so, I'm a big fan of teachers, but I'm not a big fan of incompetent teachers or teachers who don't care anymore. And so I think we ought to pay attention to that and get the best, the best teachers we can because they can make just huge differences. Uh, as as I, I, I use this example when I announce the rules, most of the time, people would look at those children and go, oh my God, they're in this language learner. They're not going to be able to succeed. And, and with the right interest and the right tools and the right motivation, these children can succeed. We just have to provide them. So I think I'm about talked out. Thank you all so much.